I want to start off talking about the UCSC campus as a living laboratory and its importance in experiential learning as a classroom uh, for our students. And then um, a big part of that is the what we call the FERP, the Forest Ecology Research Plot. And we're gonna be talking about um, different things that we're seeing happening on the for in the forest right here on the campus. And then I'm going to, if you're interested, go a little bit into how this fits into two global networks uh, called Forest Geo and Mastiff. And so how this work that is really student-centered on the campus is tied into this, these global networks. And then um, go into a little bit of the ecology that we're learning on a global scale about uh, uh, impacts of climate change and forests um, and what it is that we can get from these long-term monitoring projects. So, and again, at any time, please, um, please just interrupt me. Um, so, all of you uh, have been on the UCSC campus for a while and you have probably noticed that it is a rather special place. Um, that is one of the, the things that really drew me to, to come to Santa Cruz from, from, from Berkeley, um, just how amazing it is. And in particular, it's special to me as, a, as an ecologist and a biologist, because I see it as a, a living laboratory for experiential learning in all kinds of environmental sciences. So this is a map of the, the campus. Um, my office is right in the middle here where it says ENVS, Environmental Studies, and in the IS, ISB building. Um, where you can see down at the base of the campus, we've got the Arboretum and the farm uh, as, as wonderful experiential learning areas. Um, and then outlined in pink, is the Campus Natural Reserve, which just had a very large expansion during the last LRDP process. These are um, protected lands on the campus, uh, not protected in perpetuity, but protected for a very long time. And they, uh, the, the Natural Reserve was established to uh, protect a variety of different habitats and resources on the campus for um, teaching and research and for their value as, as habitat. The northern part of, the, the southern part of the campus is mostly meadows and Ingrid and I have decades now of work, uh, research on the meadows at the uh, southern part of campus. The northern part of campus is mostly forested with some, some also some amazing meadows up there, but it's mostly forested lands. And that's the focus that we're going to be um, um, taking today. And especially this one area right up here, uh, outlined in yellow with FERP in the middle, and that is the forest ecology research plot. And it's just north of the Cave Gulch community um, uh, off Chinkapin Road, um, so in the Seven Springs area. And it's a beautiful patch of forest. And so if you uh, take a drone up and uh, fly, fly it up and uh, create this uh, composite image, so this is a composite of hundreds and hundreds of images um, uh, in that area of the FERP. Uh, there's some meadow up here. Here's the, the, the fire road going through. Um, but there's a 400 by 400 meter area. So that's about uh, 40 acres, 16 hectares of forest that looks kind of like this from a, an, a, a hawk's eye view. We can uh, also, when we're flying over that, um, use live, uh, oh, sorry, uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of that, how big that is, this is uh, that same area, that 400 by 400 meter area of Science Hill, going from the Core West uh, parking garage over here, over to EMS and ISB, and down here to Kerr Hall. So that's about the scale of what uh, this uh, forest ecology research plot is all about. But if we, um, instead of just taking photos from above, we use, um, we fly an airplane back and forth over the campus and use uh, LIDAR uh, laser detection to map the area. We can actually look at the structure of that forest. And this is a reconstruction of, of a LIDAR overflight. And the very bright green areas on the right-hand side are very tall trees. 
These trees uh, range up to about 50 meters. They're mostly redwoods and some very large Douglas firs. The browner areas, the tan areas, are very low areas that are either bare ground or often just uh, a, a lot of shrubs right along the ground. So less than a, less than a waist high uh, shrubs or, or, or herbaceous materials. The dark green areas are mostly uh, oak trees. And then the lighter green areas in here are also mostly uh, Douglas fir. So you see in this forest, we've got um, a lot of topographical variation from 50 meter tall trees over here down to almost bare ground in the northwestern part of the, of the plot. Now with those same LIDAR overflights um, where they're you know just shooting um, uh, laser beams down and looking to see how long it takes for it to pop back up, uh, we can measure the tops of the trees which is this image or we can look at the bottom. And so this is what the ground level looks like uh, in that same area. And you can see a lot of texture. First of all, it's, it's fairly flat, it looks like sort of a flat wall or something. And it really is pretty flat. It's like a, a, a inclined book or something with the Northern part um, about um, uh, 20 meters higher in elevation than the very Southern part. And we see uh, there's a trail running through here, but there's a lot of uh, sort of the small streams that you can see running down through here. And those are seasonal streams that fill up when and if it rains um, uh, during the rainy season. But down here in the bottom right-hand corner in the southeastern part of the plot is Cave Gulch, a very deep, wet ravine that stays wet all year long. And that's a really beautiful area of deep um, redwood forest. So this is the kind of topography of that whole area that um, is, is up there in that little space just north of the Cave Gulch uh, community. So if we fly over the forest using a, a drone again and, and we can take pictures and this is kind of what the forest looks like from the top. And you can see there's, there's a lot of stuff going on out there. There's different colors of green uh, and they represent some of these are redwoods, some are Douglas firs, some are oaks, some are tan oaks. Some of them are live and, and thriving trees and others are dead and dying. And so there's a lot of diversity in here. There's spatial structure and there's dynamics. Trees growing, trees dying, new trees recruiting in. And what um, we wanna do is understand what's going on in that forest. So drones, drones are quite cool. And my, my research program, uh, largely driven by a, a current graduate student, John Detka, has gotten uh, very involved in using drones for all kinds of things, uh, uh, collaborations with folks in the engineering school. Um, but um, really, if we want to understand what's going on in forests, you've got to get in and walk around the forest and see what's happening and look at the individual trees, uh, look at where they are, how they're doing. And that's pretty much what we want to talk about today. Now, the forest has lots and lots of trees. And so if we want to understand something about the, the forest, we really need to uh, have lots and lots of people to do that. And this to me is the most special thing about the, the FERP, the Forest Ecology Research Plot, the FERP. Um, and that is the amazing students that we have uh, working up there. And since, um, since 2007, we've had a continuous stream, um, except for a small break during uh, the first year of COVID, um, of, of interns uh, working in the forest, uh, helping us learn about what's happening in the forest. And so right now, what we have is every, every single quarter, I have about 30 to, or more, uh, as many as 40 sometimes, um, interns, they get two units of credit for doing this, um, that spend six hours a week in the forest. And they are learning about the forest and they're also doing the forest ecology research that we're gonna be talking about today. And they're learning a lot about natural history uh, along the way. Um, the students come in and they spend uh, a quarter as in this, this two-unit internship. They learn how to identify the trees, how to make the measurements, how to record data, all those kinds of sorts of things. And um, some of those students, um, uh, most of them are either first year um, on campus as, as FROSH or transfer students, although we get them from throughout the, their entire time here on campus. Um, and from 
every major on campus. This isn't an environmental studies thing. This is open to everywhere on campus. And um, we get people from everywhere on campus who just want to say, hey, I want to spend some time outside and I want to learn something about where I am. And some of the students end up um, saying, hey, that was amazing. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Alexis here on the left now works for um, uh, the California Native Plant Society uh, as a field uh, ecologist. She got started there. Um, Karen um, uh, on the right here is a full-time um, tech uh, doing plant um, forest disease research at UC Davis, and others are also often different areas, but some of them also discover after a, a quarter of working in the forest, hey, you know, that was great. I learned a bunch of trees. I know what research is about, and now I will think I'm going to um, continue on my career in accounting or music or art or something else. So um, it's sometimes it's a launch for a career and sometimes it's it's a, a time of self-discovery and sometimes it's just a great way to learn about where you are in the forest. So these students, um, oh, and I wanted to mention after their first quarter, um, the ones who are really excited about it, really enthused, uh, a lot of attention to detail, hardworking and show leadership potential, uh, we hire and then they, they become crew leaders and train the next generation of interns um, in, um, in doing forest ecology research and uh, introducing them to, to the campus. So it also has this leadership and financial benefit to a number of students. I think I have seven crew leaders uh, this, this quarter uh, running different crews. And in addition to being out, outside and just doing that work, we also have them do some um, uh, uh, light academic work. One of them is they're expected to create a field guide for themselves to a bunch of the trees um, on campus. And this includes drawings or some people will take photos or paste things in um, with notes and how to identify them, natural history. It helps them to look, take the time, slow down, look and understand what's happening all around them. Um, and to learn the species, to identify the species that are out there. We also ask them to read uh, and uh, comment on and discuss uh, a couple of papers that are um, uh, associated with the, the research on the FERP so that they get a, a bigger picture of what uh, the work that we're doing up there is all about. Um, they learn how to collect and organized data both on paper and using electronic data entry and how that is that works. Um, and because of a lot of the work that we do it depends on um, some geometry and trigonometry, uh, basically mapping of where things are, or figuring out how tall they are. Um, I also set up a, a video and some worksheets um, to help people remember the, the basic pre-calculus and trigonometry and geometry um, that they, they have seen before in high school mm -hmm. and many have, have tried to forget, but uh, give them a, a sense of why that is useful um, and how we use it. Um, but mostly we're re really trying to get students out there looking carefully and doing uh, interesting work. Many of the students um, who um, do this, um, not many, but a number of them, become uh, really enamored with what can be done on the, on the FERP. Um, this is Alejandro Huerta, um, who uh, a number of years ago was one of our first uh, FERPers out there helping to put in the FERP. And then she did a senior thesis research on diseases uh, on, the, on the tree and then went off to Madison for graduate school. And she is now an assistant professor at North Carolina State University. Um, just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful researcher uh, that uh, I still am very close to. So what the students are doing out there is a number of different things in the forest. They are mapping in trees, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, before, so we know where every tree is to about a meter in this whole area. They measure it using very standardized protocols. 
Um, we measure the trees at exactly the same height, 1.3 meters breast height. It's called diameter at breast height using either calipers or these special uh, tapes that we have. We enter the data either on iPads, depending on how we're doing it, or on paper. And then all of the trees are tagged with individual identifying numbers. Big trees, they have it nailed into the tree and small uh, trees, it gets tied around to the base. So this is what um, all of our hundreds of, of interns have been doing over the years. That means every single tree out there is mapped. Here's a map of just a, a small quadrat, 20 by 20 meters of all the trees. We can identify how big they are over time and how they change. And that allows us to take what is a forest that looks like this from above and translate it into something like this, which is a map of all of the trees uh, on trees, sh shrubs, and woody vines um, across the FERP um, with different size um, dots according to the diameter of the trees, how big they are around. And uh, the color patterns are um, uh, show their, their family associations. Uh, greens are conifers, oranges are um, oaks, um, uh, blues are um, uh, um, um, uh, Eric Casey, uh, blueberry family uh, uh, plants. Um, and then there's others mixed in there. And I, I love this image because um, it kind of reminds me of the, um, those, uh, those images that you're supposed to look at for, and you like see a number or a letter in them uh, for detecting colorblindness. And since I'm colorblind, um, this uh, always reminds me of that. And I, I um, play around a lot with, um, with colors that I'm able to see, um, even though I, I'm not seeing any numbers or anything in here. So, um, so all of that taken together, having all those students out there in this, this special place that's a 25 minute walk from, um, from, the, from Science Hill. So uh, students all, gather together, they put on their white suits to protect them from poison oak, walk up the hill, spend six hours identifying trees and measuring them, coming back, has resulted in the forest ecology research plot. We map and tag and identify and measure every single woody stem that is bigger than your pinky at breast height, at 1.3 meters, this height, um, across those 40 acres. And that means we have measured 31,117 trees, shrubs, and lianas. And some of those have multiple stems, like a, vac uh, uh, a blue, uh, huckleberry uh, shrub will have a bunch of stems, or a uh, um, California hazelnut will have a bunch of stems. So we actually have 47,000 stems that have been measured. And they included in that are 34 different woody species from 18 different families. So there's a lot of diversity up there. And I actually put the plot specifically there because it was a place that was especially uh, diverse in the forest. Um, we first put the plot in in 2007. And uh, then uh, we remeasure it um, every five years. So we remeasure it in 2012. At that time, it was only six hectares. Um, and we were asked if we could expand it. And we did. So then we spent the next uh, three years expanding it to 16 hectares and then remeasured it. And now we are in uh, the 2022 re-census. So that would be the, the 15th year from the original plot that was measured. And we're, we're right in the thick of that right now. So some things that we've learned about uh, the FERP um, are, are here in this table. And the, the most common species by numbers are shown here in order from top to bottom in number of individuals that we have. Um, so Douglas fir is the most common uh, tree out there. And then we've got three uh, trees from the oak family, Shreve's oak, tan oak, and coast live oak. The first and the third are both true oaks and tan oak is a, is a very special uh, oak, uh, oak family tree 
with a lot of history in, in Santa Cruz. Uh, its bark is full of tannic acid and it was a mainstay of the tanning industry. One of the reasons why we have the tannery here uh, for tanning leather, um, uh, harvest the bark of it to use in tanning leather, a uh, common tree in the area. Poison oak, which is not an oak at all, uh, but numerically it's incredibly common. And this is actually a dramatic undercount of poison oak because it seldom gets to be big enough to measure, which is, you know, remember, it's pinky sized all the way up at, at, size, at the height of your chest. So it's probably the most common plant on the FERP. Um, and it's out there. And one of the problems is, of course, it is, it is toxic, which is why we always uh, address all of our our students in head to toe hazmat suits. Um, then the, the last two are uh, Coast Redwood and Pacific Madrones. And after that, there's all the rest of the 34 species, uh, much less common, but these are the ones that are, are really pretty common. Now, what's interesting here, at least to me, is if we look at Douglas fir, that makes up about a quarter, 21, 24% of all of the individuals out there. And if you look at how big the trees are and sort of imagine cutting them off across uh, the stump and then measure the area of that stump, that's called the basal area of the tree. So a big tree has a large basal area, a small tree has a small uh, basal area. And if we add up the basal area of all the Douglas firs, it's fairly similar, 32% of the basal area. So you know, a quarter to a third of all of the wood out there and all of the individuals are Douglas fir. That's the most dominant thing. But then if we look at the oaks, they're very common in numbers, 23, 22%, um, but they're only three or 4% of the basal area. So about the wood, the amount of wood out there is much, much less uh, than for Douglas fir. Poison oak, of course, is incredibly abundant, but they're so small, they hardly make up any of the basal area. And then we get to coast redwood, not all that common. Only 4% of all the individuals out there in this forest are, are coast redwoods, but they make up over half of all the basal area. Big, huge trees occupying a lot of the biomass that's out there. Um, maybe not surprising, but to me that it's 10 times more uh, abundant here as, as, as the mass, mass of the redwood trees. Um, uh, is really interesting. So I see a comment, um, and it's nice that most of the redwood trees were planted by UCSC when it was originated. True. And that's not true, actually. So the redwoods have a, gr a really important history here on campus. And um, uh, nearly all of the campus forest was clear cut um, during the, the ranch days, starting in the late 1800s and finishing around 1920. So in that period, almost all the trees uh, on the campus were cut down, including all the redwoods. Much of the FERP, actually, the western part of the FERP apparently was not cut. The eastern part was, but the western part was not clear cut during that time. And I think it probably has something to do with its relationship to the Cave Gulch community, but it's not clear why. But the redwoods in particular um, were, were cut down um, and you know now we think of you know redwoods as being wonderful for you know making decks or uh, actually the houses in Panama in the town that I live in, which was all built um, at the um, uh, in the early part of the 1900s as as part of uh, the construction of the canal. Many of those buildings, and not the one that I own now, but the one that I lived in previous to that for many years. Uh, were built by redwood from the central coast of California. So the U.S. military um, shipped in redwood um, to construct those houses in Panama at that time. But the campus redwoods were cut down and used as fuel in the, um, in the lime kilns uh, primarily. So the quarries were uh, quarrying out limestone, and then the redwoods were used as fuel to, uh, to heat the limestone to convert it to lime, which was then used for cement, um, among other things, to reconstruct uh, San Francisco after the, the, the Great Fire. What's special about the redwoods is after you cut them down, they are exceptional at re-sprouting. And so um, uh, unlike if you cut down a pine tree or a Douglas fir, once you cut it down, it is dead. Redwoods are great sprouters. 
And if you walk around, you'll often see a, a ring, like a fairy ring of uh, redwoods that are all in a circle with a large stump right in the middle. And those are all genetic copies, offspring, resprouts of that cut down tree. And most of the most of the redwoods on campus are resprouts of trees that were cut down in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There are some places where they came in as seeds as well. Redwoods do not seed in well except after large disturbances, um, like after fires. Um, but um, most of them are were not planted, but were actually resprouts from those forests. So basically, all of the all of the um, the redwoods, all of the forest on campus is somewhere 110 to 150 years old, sort of in that range. And the redwoods in particular are all um, three spots. So um, let's see. So I'll stop right there before I go into the next part. Um, are there any other questions that people have? You can either speak up or, or, or chat it in. Well, I'll ask one then, uh, Greg. There are yeah. areas where there are a lot of scrubby little trees. And so one, is, is that natural? Would they be thinned? Should they be thinned? Yeah, there are a bunch of areas with really, really dense, especially uh, Douglas firs that come in, um, and a few areas with fairly dense redwoods, but especially the, the Douglas firs are the ones that I see as be coming in really, really densely. And those are generally, they've come in after some kind of a disturbance. It might have been, there's one place in the northeastern part of the FERP that has incredibly dense um, Right here, if you can see my cursor, sort of in the right mm -hmm. next to the road, there's this really dense dark green. That's all Douglas fir. And they're just packed in so tight. And this area actually was burned at some time. And what I think happened was it burned through the understory and we just had a massive um, explosion of Douglas fir seedlings that have all come up and now they're dying. So they are self-thinning. If what we wanted to do was grow a whole bunch of big, Douglas firs, yes, then what you would want to do is go in and thin them out so that they grow faster and produce lumber that you can then cut down. If on the other hand, what you want to see is a forest going through its natural dynamics, um, they'll, they'll thin themselves out through competition. So a couple of questions, uh, Bar for... Barbara and Mark Gordon. Mark, you had a question? You might be muted. You are muted. <laughs> All right. Well, Mark is going. Cindy Seckel, or maybe it's Ron. You have a question. It's Cindy. It's Cindy. Um, I have a question about how intact is that area since the CZU fire? Yes. Great question. So <laughs> while watching the CZU fire get closer and closer, yeah. I was pretty convinced that uh, my forest ecology research plot was going to be a uh, fire ecology research plot. Right. And it, <laughs> it did not burn. Um, so the, the fire never came onto campus. It was within two kilometers. Um, uh, a lot of the, the efforts of, of fire containment uh, really uh, kept it from, from coming onto that part of campus. Um, so uh, it, it has not burned. Uh, those fires, fires have not burned, forests have not burned in a very long time. Uh, we, my lab is actually working just up the hill in comparative sites in areas that did burn from CCU, but we, we did not burn. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So Mark or Barbara, mm -hmm. did you have a question? Yes, I, I do have a question. My question has to do with the redwoods re-sprouting. And I'm wondering if that has to do with the, their root structure, which is just so extensive and integrated one tree with another. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it's not so much about the root structure as they have, um, uh, as, as do all trees, they have uh, growing cambial tissue, which is the, the part of the tissue that uh, allows um, for the formation of new Right. branches, new, new leaves, new, new everything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how the tree grows radially. And, um, 
within that, there are um, growing uh, dormant buds um, of this, this, this growing tissue. And when something happens to the main growing part of the tree, it stimulates those buds to start to grow and make new shoots. So it's not really coming out of the, um, the roots, but out of the burl right at the base of the tree. Um, and redwoods have those, but um, none of the other conifers here have them. Some of the other broadleaf trees, like madrones and bay laurels and, and, and uh, things like that are also really good at sprouting, but uh, the redwoods are the only ones that can sprout. Thank you. Okay, maybe and one last about one, the, and then we'll let uh, go back. Ron, did you have a question about the fungus network underground? Uh, we are doing some work on fungi, um, and we're, uh, we, uh, we mostly focus on the fun fungal networks above ground, actually, although uh, we, we do dabble in a bunch of different things uh, with the, the underground networks as well. Okay. Is that the last question? So, okay, there's plenty of time for, for more questions coming up. So let's take a little bit of, um, gonna show you a little bit of data um, about, and some store, some natural history stories about what's happening with our, tr our particular trees and our particular forest that we've been learning. And the first one, I'm just gonna show you a couple of graphs here. So this is the population dis size distribution for Douglas firs. So in most populations, we expect uh, of, of, of living organisms, we expect to have a whole lot of small individuals and that um, the, uh, through mortality, so you put out with, with trees or with plants in general, you put out lots of seeds, you get a lot of small individuals. But then a lot of those will die over time, like, like uh, we were talking about thinning out of the, the trees. And so you have fewer and fewer big ones in a particular area, but lots of small ones. And so if, if you look at almost any normal population of, of plants or most animals as well, you'll see something like this going from the small ones on the left. These are one to two centimeters. So these are the pinky sized ones in the big bar. Then these are sort of thumb size to uh, almost your wrist sized in the next one. And then these get bigger and bigger and bigger. Out here, if you like spread out your, your arms, that's about 150 centimeters right here. So that's how big a tree would be if it was as big as your, your outspread arms out here. So you can see very few big ones and a whole lot of small ones. Um, and this is the expected pattern. And so this is for Douglas fir. We have that same pattern for Shreve's oak can go down the list and lots and lots of the species that we have have the same kind of pattern. Redwood's a little bit weird and that's partly because it is very long-lived. Things don't kill redwoods except for chainsaws uh, in general um, and you end up with, we still have a, a lot of small ones, these are all stump sprouts, and but then we have this big hump over here of pretty big trees including some really really big trees out here. Okay, so it's kind of a little weird one, but you know, redwoods got a, a strange life history. They grow, they get big fast, and they, they don't die very, very much. But here's a really weird one, and I want to highlight this. And this is Pacific Madrone, which I think is my, my most favorite California tree. It's just, it's a beautiful tree with, you know, red peeling bark, and it always grows in crazy directions. It doesn't grow straight up like a normal tree. It grows off at angles and twists around. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful tree, but you can see that its size structure is kind of backwards. We have hardly any small trees out there, and we've got a whole lot of really pretty big trees in this 16 to 32 centimeter area. These are pretty big, big trees out here, and then it drops off precipitously, right? So there's a huge number that are all in this one size class here, or maybe these two size classes. And that's very strange. And this has to do with, um, we think, um, it's natural history. And um, madrones uh, produce lots and lots of, of red fruits with seeds in them that birds eat and distribute and 
up at different places and they'll, they'll fall on the ground um, and they grow and they make lots of seedlings. But unless they have a lot of light, they'll die. They're, they're really high light demanding species. So pretty much the only place time that you get um, madrones starting off life in a forest is after a big disturbance, like a big clear cut or like a fire. And, and then the trees grow and they continue to grow um, uh, and get bigger and bigger and they can be pretty big trees, but they don't reproduce in the forest. Even if they're making tons and tons of seeds, they're not uh, regenerating very much. Um, and so what's happened here is we had at some point a major disturbance with a large population of madrones that all got started after a large disturbance and have been growing and growing and growing and growing without filling in in the back. And now there's a precipitous decline off the end of them, right? So that's basically, they haven't gotten any bigger than that. They got to be this size because that's how old they are. The ones that we have uh, cored are now 120 to 130 years old. So that's about how long ago that disturbance probably was. So this is a really interesting thing. Now, continuing on that theme of those madrones, now we've got this even age stand of, of lots of madrones there. If we look at the trees in the forest from one time period to another, this in this particular graph is from 2012 to 2017, um, then we have the per percent of all of the trees in the FERP that died in that five year period. And up here at the top is Pacific Madrone at 55%. More than half of all of the Pacific Madrones died in that five year period. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. That is, it was, it's shocking. And walking around, you're just seeing them dying over and over. So half of them died since 2012. The other species in that five year period, all of the oaks and the firs are all in here somewhere between four and 5% mortality per year. Still, you know, that's still fairly high mortality, but redwood here at 9% over, over that five year period. So very, very low mortality in the redwoods. Okay. So this um, kind of um, mortality here with the Pacific Madrone is really something that, that stands out. And I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the difference, these three starred, uh, species here, Pacific Madrone, Tan Oaks, and Douglas Firs, and what's happening with um, this mortality. So the Madrones, here's a, here's a Madrone, and you can see it, it's still alive. It's got a, a cr crown up here. It's got this red bark here. But you can see that a big chunk of it has fallen off and is dead. These branches are all dead. So this is in the process of dying, and chances are this, this tree will be dead in another year or so. Um, we have this even age stand, it's a light demanding species. The other thing that happened was the Douglas firs all around it have grown up to be very tall. So it's shading out the trees and it's stressing it. We've also seen the accumulation of a bunch of different pathogens of the roots, of the stems and of the leaves. And it's a very particular species that is susceptible to, um, to drought. And so those impacts of the diseases on the, on the leaves and the branches help increase its susceptibility to drought. We're in a historic drought, and that is pushing these old trees that are now sort of even age senescing trees, and they are dying, and they're dying in patches. So it's a combination, we think, of being an, an even aged stand of senescing trees that are attacked by pathogens in a drought period, and they all came in at the same time. If you go to other places with high light, you don't see this kind of mortality, but we are, we are dramatically losing all the madrones on the forest. Now, the second species that I, I highlighted with a star was um, tan oak. And that one actually didn't show that big of a mortality between 2012 and 2017. And that's because most of them had already died. Um, mm -hmm. it, so this was showing almost a 5% annual mortality during that period, but we actually lost a huge number of them in the five years before that. Um, and that's from the emergence of this introduced pathogen, Phytophthora remorum, which causes sudden oak death on oaks and tan oaks. Mm -hmm. 
And tan oak was the second most common species on the FERP when we first put it in. And it, the FERP was free, uh, the, the pathogen was introduced uh, originally from Southeast uh, China, Japan, um, uh, sort of Eastern Asia, introduced into Europe and then introduced from Germany into Santa Cruz County in the mid 1990s, um, where it spread throughout Santa Cruz County and it has killed millions of trees. Uh, you can see all the dead tan oaks in the background here on the FERP. Um, and we, it first appeared in the forest just after we established the forest. Um, and so between 2007, 2009, the blue dots here show how it started on the north and has moved through and eventually uh, killed a very, very large proportion of all of the, the tan oaks. So we don't have that as many left and the mortality is slowing down. The other thing that has just started to happen in the most very recent years uh, are these Douglas firs. Um, so these are all Douglas firs. And if you look in here, you can see a number of them are either naked or brown. And what we're seeing now is stands of Douglas firs on the FERP in, in groups that are dying very quickly. And there are two pathogens that are associated with those. This Felinus pinei, now called uh, Porodidalia, um, and this other one, Fomatopsis pinicola. And these are both heart rot fungi that go in through the bases and get inside the tree. The inside of a tree is actually uh, composed of a lot of dead wood that carries water and living wood that carries sap and nutrients. And Felinus in particular is able to colonize both of the dead and the, the living wood, uh, Fomatopsis a little bit as well. Both of them weaken the trees dramatically and they um, can structurally so that they can fall down in storms, but they can also uh, prevent them from growing and eventually kill them. And we have seen just in the, in the last three, four years, a dramatic increase in these mortality centers uh, on Douglas fir. So this is something we're, we're just starting to look at. And one of the ways we can look at that is with these uh, computerized tomography systems, CT scans. We basically have a CT scanner for trees. Mm -hmm. And we can walk up to a tree and in about a half an hour, do a cross section of the tree and the top of the tree uh, top image right here is a healthy tree. It's brown all the way around. Don't worry too much about the like little light areas around the outside. That's kind of an artifact. Um, but then if the tree is decayed on the inside, we get these bright um, colored areas. And that shows uh, with the magenta areas, this is probably hollow. All the green area is um, really soft decayed tissue. So we can do this and we've done this on thousands of trees on the, on the forest. And this is one of the things that we're, we're following through to see what's happening with these trees. So on our forest, we're seeing dramatic changes right now. Um, we've seen the, the ten oaks from uh, a, an, an invasive pathogen. We've seen uh, the, um, the madrones dying, that's probably a combination of history and climate change. And these um, Douglas firs were still early on, but it's probably from these pathogens that are becoming more and more important. These are native pathogens that have been around for a long time, but their effects are now being felt. So those are things that we're seeing. Um, so just a couple, just a really quick tour of a couple of, actually, let's say, do you have any questions about um, any of the, the tree mortality things or the, uh, the growth or the patterns and the things that are happening with our trees on the campus? Yes. Um, I have a question about the Douglas firs. Um, we are located north of Scotts Valley and we have seen the same thing with the madrones and the large Douglas firs. And I'm wondering if drought in recent years is contributing to the death of the Douglas firs in particular, because we're seeing very, very large trees dying, not small ones. Yep. And I thought that they were in part due to the fact that we've had a drought in so many recent years. Yes, um, it's a great question. And um, my answer is a, is a very waffly probably um, <laughs> that it's related. Um, trees uh, will sometimes, some trees will die, you know, directly from drought if it's extended enough, that, that will happen. Um, but most often what happens is what we call the disease triangle. And there's an interaction between the environment and the host plant and any pathogens that are out there. And the same thing with, with insects as well. 
And that when you have a drought, it creates particular kinds of stress conditions in the trees that makes them more susceptible to pathogens that might've been around for a long time, but really not bothering them very much. And uh, suddenly under the drought conditions, it becomes much more serious. So the drought is probably a really important inducing factor, but not the direct cause of the death. And it's probably related to attack by pathogens or by insects that are exacerbated by the drought. Yeah. Bill, Bill Patterson, you had a question. Do you see opportunistic uh, species coming in and taking uh, the opportunity of this death, this diseasing? You mean opportunistic uh, plant species? Yes. What's going to come in in the next two decades? That is a huge question that we are so excited to try to answer. And we're, we're spending a lot of time actually looking at uh, recruitment of species coming in uh, to those areas and what things are going to look like over time. We do have some invasive species in the forest, but really not that many with the exception of holly. Holly is the one thing that is really worrisome. And uh, there's a lot of holly planted all over around the, in cave gulch uh, community in people's backyards because they're beautiful. Uh, and those berries have made it <laughs> throughout the forest. And we now have two reproductive uh, individuals on the FERP and lots and lots of small ones coming in. And uh, that's actually a, a sort of a, a debate that we, we have uh, about how to handle the forest. One could say we should go in and get rid of those invasive species. Um, or we can say, well, this is a great opportunity to learn about um, the dynamics and the invasions by those species into the forest. So, so far we have taken the approach of we're, we're watching and learning um, rather than managing in that particular forest. Um, as far as other species, a lot, of the, a lot of it is just a shift in the native species, which things are more abundant in which places. And so we're really interested in, in uh, what the pattern is there. Currently what it looks like is we're heading towards, we had been thinking we were really heading towards a, a much more dominant uh, Douglas fir forest, replacing a lot of the things that were, were disappearing. But now the Douglas firs are starting to show this die back. And so um, we're not sure exactly where it's going to go, but that's a big part of what we're interested in. Galen, did you have a question? Yeah. Are these CT scans from the Douglas fir? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep, these are. Yeah, so the top one's a healthy one, and the bottom one is one that has a would, it would, this one uh, actually had one of those fungi growing right about here, coming out of wow. it, right about number five. <laughs> wow. So that's, that's exactly the way it looks. And we've, we've used this, um, I've scanned many thousands of trees, both here and in Panama. Uh, we were talking earlier about urban trees. And one of the things we've done is use these uh, for assessment of um, the health of urban trees and whether they are hazards. Um, and that need to be managed in, in different ways. So, Nancy Mead? Yes, I had a question about the, uh, uh, the sudden death syndrome on the, uh, mentioned the tan oak being affected, but did, do I understand that the other oaks were not affected by that? Right, so that's a great observation. So uh, the true oaks are very susceptible to sudden oak death, absolutely. Um, but there's a critical distinction. The tan oaks are um, infected by the pathogen, the tree dies, and then the pathogen, while the tree is dying, and shortly thereafter, the pathogen reproduces on the tree and spreads to its neighbors. And so it, it, it spreads through the population. Mm. With true oaks, true oaks are a dead end host. So there, um, where the pathogen came from in uh, Southeast China, south of Japan, uh, Vietnam, <coughs> that, that region is where the pathogen came from, uh, has uh, close relatives of tan oak. It, um, and it seems to be a, a strong pathogen there. It's not a place with a lot of true oaks, of the, Quir the Quercus oaks. Uh -huh. And um, the Quercus oaks are dead-end hosts that they are tremendously susceptible, the pathogen goes in and the tree dies in a, in a couple of years. 
but the pathogen cannot reproduce. Mm. So the pathogen dies with the host. Mm. And the only way that the oaks get infected generally is if they are living near to a bay laurel. Huh. Bay laurel is another host, but the, in that case, the pathogen actually infects the leaves and it hardly, hardly bothers the, the bay laurel at all, the California bay at all. It grows on the leaves, causes a little bit of damage on the leaf tissue, but it produces huge amounts of spores that then splash onto the oaks, infect the oaks and kill the oaks. And we, on the FERP, by chance, we have almost no California bay. Uh -huh. it, there's a couple of very small individuals, but it means that the oaks themselves are really pretty protected in that particular forest because there's no bay. Huh. And the other areas which have lots of tan oaks, all the tan oaks die. And a few of the oaks that are mixed in with the tan oaks, they have also gotten sick from the tan oaks and died. But in general, the oaks are fine and the tan oaks are the ones that are really suffering. So it's not true everywhere. Since I love those oaks, I'm very glad to hear that. I yeah. also have a question about, do I, um, my recollection is that, that California is the only place, I think in the world, where the, um, the, um, the redwoods uh, exist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Just wanted to double check on that. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, uh, out of out of the uh, in a talk from from the, a few of the things that I was going to talk about, and go on to this this other topic that I wanted to mention, and this is about phenology, and the phenol phenology is the timing of biological events like reproduction, producing you know when do trees produce new leaves if they're deciduous? When do they produce flowers? When do they make their fruits and seeds? And uh, we're also interested in those seeds that are produced, how far they go and how many they're making. So this is, we do this with this, with these litter traps or phenology traps, which is basically just window screen on a PVC framework. And we've got 115 of these scattered all throughout the FERP. This is a map of where all of them are. And every two weeks, students go through and identify all of the seeds or if there's flowers or fruits. And we also look at leaf fall and things like that. And so we can look at the seasonal patterns of what's happening. And so for instance, this is a map or a graph of the, the timing from January through December of flowering or new leaf fall uh, or seed production and fruit production for Pacific madrones. And basically they start to make their seeds and fruits in December that continues through March and then Occasionally you'll find a few more falling, but it's almost all constrained to that area. Because we know where all the madrones are and where all the traps are, we can also make estimates of how far those seeds move. So we've been doing this since 2008. And the, those data, those phenology data, <clears throat> together with the, the, all the other data from the FERP, tie us into two really cool, important global networks called Forest Geo and Mastiff. So our plot, all of these, um, uh, uh, hmm, uh, all the, the kinds of data, all the way we collect the data are not something I invented. This is something I actually learned in my years in Panama. And I actually went to Panama to work on the original FERP, which was right here on Barro Colorado Island in the middle of the Panama Canal, run by the Smithsonian Tropical Inst Research Institute, where Steve Hubble and Robin Foster, uh, two tremendous ecologist, started a, a forest ecology research plot in the middle of this old growth rain, rainforest um, where they mapped not 16 hectares, but 50 hectares and about a quarter of a million trees. Wow. And I went there to study disease movement through that forest and spent the next five years doing that. After that plot was first established in the early 1980s, a number of other plots got put in, mostly in Southeast Asia. And then they started spreading around the tropical world in Brazil, in uh, Ecuador, um, in more places in Asia. Um, and then a number of us who were trained in working in the tropics 
got faculty positions in different places in the northern climates. And we decided we wanted to do the same thing. And so when I came to Santa Cruz, I saw this as an opportunity and put in a plot. And it was actually the very first temperate zone plot that was completed um, in 2007. Since then, there's a bunch more throughout North America. And the Chinese Academy of Sciences created this, this tremendous latitudinal uh, network as well. Um, and so there's now 73 different plots that all use exactly the same methodology. That's the key. We all adapted to collecting the data in exactly the same ways, and we share the data across this network. Now, one thing that's special, here's Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz has a Mediterranean climate, right? We have um, uh, dry summers and cool, wet winters. And the other places around the world where you find Mediterranean climate is, of course, the Mediterranean, Chile, South Africa, and two places in Australia. Incredibly important biological hotspots of diversity and dynamics. Um, we are the only plot in this entire network from the Mediterranean climate. So we anchor that entire biome for the world on our plot. We are also, um, actually until last week I could say, we are the only one that is driven entirely on student power. This is mostly done uh, by uh, uh, professional researchers being hired as crews. Now, my friend um, who's at University of Illinois, just last week, they uh, entered the network with a new net, uh, plot that was done, basically modeled after our model of being done all by students. The other network is Mastiff, and this is coordinated out of Duke by Jim Clark. And this is a, a, based on this mathematical model for using the phenology data to look at how far seeds move, how many there are, and using these networks across the world of people that have been monitoring seed production uh, over, over time. And so these two things together, the map of all the trees, plus all of the, the phenology data have allowed us to learn a whole bunch of really cool things. And just as an example, these are just the publications from these two networks that include the FERP data just in the last two years. So we get lots and lots of publications. And a lot of these have to do with tree reproduction. And I'll just say a couple of things about questions. Let's see, timing. Um, uh, that we're, we're actively trying to understand um, uh, that's bigger than just UCSC. And one is that as climate change is driving, you know, where, where trees like to live, suitable environmental conditions, they're driving it northward and higher in elevation. Can the trees keep up? That is, can the, are the trees making enough seeds where they're needed to be able to follow the, the impacts of climate change? The other thing relates back to something like the CZU fires and all the other fires happening all over. When we have major forest disturbances like wildfires, where do seeds come from to regenerate those forests? And the data from the FERP and other places are helping to understand that. And one of the things that has come out of these, our, our data and others, is that if you, is answering this, this question that has been around since long before I was a graduate student, I remember this as a big question, do trees senesce? So if we think about, you know, human populations, your ability to reproduce increases up to a certain point and then decreases at a certain point. So there's senescence as, as you get older. And there's a lot of questions about whether that's true in, in trees, and we now have those data. This is size of the trees, and as trees get bigger and bigger, they produce more and more seeds until a peak, and then most of them decline over time. So they actually senesce when they get to be very big. So there's this sweet spot when you're getting more and more fecundity. A few trees will just keep making more and more seeds as they get bigger and bigger, but most trees look something like this they senesce when they get very large. And this is really important. If we think about trees getting larger and then flattening or declining, like these two species here, um, it ties in with climate change because with increasing CO2, with warmer temperatures, and in some places with greater moisture availability, that means trees will grow faster and they'll make more seeds. That's great, but when the trees are very large, the trees will continue to grow, but it actually makes them make fewer and fewer seeds. 
it pushes them further into senescence. And what we've found from these networks, including the FERP, is that in the East Coast, where there's lots of small trees, younger forests coming up, that climate change and the increased moisture that's coming in the East Coast is actually driving the trees to be growing faster and making lots of seeds. But over here in the West, the trees are getting bigger, but they're actually producing fewer and fewer seeds. So it's not killing trees now, but it's reducing the opportunity for trees to reproduce, replace the forests over time, specifically in the Western forests. Oh. That also affects where those trees are gonna go. So as the, the temperature increases going, moving the places trees wanna live going towards the North, where we have high temperatures, especially here in the West, uh, the moisture, the blue areas are wetter than expected in the East, drier than expected in the West. This is what's happening. And if the plants are needing to move into wetter and you know, warmer places further north where they're more comfortable, we have to have those trees reproducing in the places where they need the seeds. And what we've been able to do using this network is say, right around here in the West in Santa Cruz, those trees are producing seed. They're producing less because they're very big, but they're producing seeds in the places that they're going to be needed, where um, they're producing the most seeds in the places that are going to be in the future, the best place for them to grow. In the East Coast, however, they're not. In the East Coast, they're producing all the seeds dramatically in, down in more Southern places, but the places where those seedlings and the plants are doing best are far, far away. And so they're not producing seeds that can help with natural migration in response to climate change. So these patterns are allowing us to predict using these long-term monitoring things, what, how the forests are going to be responding. Similarly, in response to um, uh, fires like this, we've been able to study um, the um, numbers of seeds that are being produced by the different species, where they're being produced enough, and um, uh, that's helping to guide where we need to intervene, where we need to actually grow up seedlings and plant them out uh, for different places. And in particular, the conifers are the ones that are going to have the hardest time. So these are all the kinds of things that we've gotten from, from, the, from the study. Taken all together, we've got lots and lots of different things that we're learning from the forests, their composition, their dynamics, what's driving those things, we're starting to learn more about ecosystem services. I haven't talked about it at all today, but we work on species interactions with mammals and birds and, and lizards and lichens and diseases. Um, and all together that brings us back to that these forests are really dynamic places right here on the campus. It's changing as we're watching it. Climate change and those pests are causing those changes. And in some places around the world, those forests are keeping up with the global changes. Other places are gonna need our help. And um, that these kind of long-term monitoring efforts are really what allow us to do that. But mostly what I want you to come away with is just a remembrance of just how special a place we have here in the UCSC campus, what it is that our students are able to do um, and learn and the kind of contributions that they can make. And I just wanted to note that, you know, this is, all this is on the Campus Natural Reserve. Uh, Alex Jones, who's the reserve manager, is tremendous, tremendous help in helping make all of this uh, work as well. And we've had funding from a whole variety of different sources uh, over time. And with that, I will um, stop sharing if I can. There we go, stop sharing. And I would be more than happy to address other questions that you've got. Um, okay, so I see a couple of questions here. Redwoods uh, on drip irrigation. I would be really cautious about um, uh, uh, irrigating um, the, the redwoods from the bottom. Redwoods are really good at uh, getting uh, moisture from, from fog. And some of that is, much of that is absorbed directly. Some of that drips down. Uh, but you, um, one thing that can happen with 
drip irrigating redwoods is you can actually weaken the root systems uh, and over longer periods of time uh, end up weakening the trees. Um, redwoods in the Himalayan mountains in Tibet, um, that might be, uh, I don't know if that's our redwood or there is a, uh, there are close relatives. There are several species that are closely related. Uh, bald cypress is one on the East Coast. There's the Dawn redwood, which is in, um, in Asia. So the, I would kind of expect that the ones in Tibet would be the, um, uh, the Dawn redwoods. Um, but I don't know. Uh, Joel Primick, uh, what's the future of our local redwoods, both on campus and the old redwoods that were never clear cut? Um, my expectation from what we've seen is um, that the redwoods themselves, uh, we're, we're not looking at massive mortality of the existing trees. Um, they're, they're, they're resilient once they get to be uh, quite, quite large. Um, except to chainsaws. Um, however, uh, one of the things that they um, need to replace the forests over a long period of time is, uh, is disturbances. Um, and uh, so the fires can be good disturbances in, when they are not too severe. And that's one of the things that we're interested in and in, in how big these really massive fires are in affecting them. Um, and the one real concern is the ability of the redwoods to seed and to produce seeds to be able to keep up with climate change into the future. So whether they will be able to move into the areas um, that are going to be redwood habitat uh, in the future. And one of the big limitations is climate change has a huge effect on fog and we don't know what's gonna happen there. I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, Galen. Again. Oh, yeah. Uh, could you say again what the blue dots meant in your first mapping with the blue dots, the yellow, the orange, and the, in your first map? Uh, um, they were um, Ericaceae, so um, uh, blueberry, blueberry family. So they are um, what family? Uh, madrones and, oh, okay. and huckleberries. Okay, um, thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Eric, Eric Casey E. Galen, sorry. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so we have we have three families that are really common, the Eric Casey E, the blueberry family, the oak family, and the, the pines are the, the most common species up there. So uh, Ron, you had your hand up. Yeah, I do, uh, thank you. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. The, the first one is, I thought I heard you say that you did a 15-year comparison at, at the very beginning. You mentioned that, that you sort of measured everything and then again 15 years later and compared the two. Every um, five years, actually. Every five. Okay. So um, I was just wondering, what because um, we've heard, of, it feels like I've heard about a whole bunch of them that are being hurt. Who is... Uh, Survive, who's which one is growing in terms of the the numbers there yeah that's a that's a really good question so the um the, we we currently what we're seeing is that the rates of mortality are bigger than the rates of of replenishment so i think what we're seeing is actually a thinning of the forest and in part that's because i think um the, the Douglas firs have gone, grown to be so large that they are um, just shading everything out. So for instance, back in 2007, we had quite a good population of manzanitas on the plot. And now I think we've got four or five individuals that are still alive. The rest wow. of them just all shaded out and, and died. And it's a transformation oh. of the forest. So it's thinning out. So the things that are increasing, um, we see uh, a lot of Douglas firs that are coming in and uh, some oaks that are coming in, uh, fortunately. And there's some shrubs that seem to be doing pretty well, including our, we've got an invasive catoniaster. And then I mentioned the, the holly, so. My, my second question, if I may, um, you had all those, I forget how many you said, uh, it, I thought you said like a over a hundred things that catch the seeds and mm -hmm. uh, with the screens. 
and so I was thinking of uh, like a participant observer that sometimes these things that we do change the observations because of what we're doing. And so after you count the seeds and everything, do you then drop them in the same place or do we throw them away somewhere else? No, we drop them in the same place. We actually take a stick and we whack it from the bottom. And so they just spray up and ah. fall into the area right, right around them. Wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> Richard, Richard, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm probably one of the few people that's also been to Boro, Colorado, which is uh, probably worth a talk on its own. It's an amazing research uh, capability. That's good. And I don't want to divert from the Mediterranean climate, but uh, is the same amount of uh, research going into the Amazonian forest with the expectation somewhere of being able to um, mitigate the damage being done? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a number of places in the tropics that have similar kinds of plots that we have, like Baro Colorado Island, there's um, in Ecuador, some other places. But the, in the Amazon, uh, well, actually there is a plot in Northern Amazon. There's one like this. But the main focus in the Amazon has instead been to create many, many, many small plots that are investigated less intensely, but distributed over a much wider area to capture some of the diversity of the rainforest. So they take a different approach of many small plots, less intensively studied um, in comparison to our highly intense study of, 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 uh, of a few plots. And they're complementary. Um, and just because of the vastness of, of the Amazon and how it varies from place to place, that probably is the more appropriate uh, uh, thing. The main things that are really worrisome in, in the Amazon right now, um, besides cutting, humans are, human destruction is, is always the biggest thing happening in the Amazon. But one of the really big things that's related to climate change is that the woody vines, our most common woody vine here is poison oak, but there are many, many kinds of woody vines in the tropics. And they are able to take advantage of increased CO2 much, much faster than can trees because they can just grow long, supporting themselves, climbing over top of the other trees. And they have dramatically outgrown the rate of the growth of trees in the Amazon forests. And they are weighing them down and they're outcompeting them for light and they're knocking them down. And we're, we're seeing massive mortality of trees in the forest that's mm -hmm. caused by these, these lianas that normally would just be a part of the forest. And that's driven directly by increased CO2. Mm. Uh, Nancy, me? Yeah, uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, knowing your expertise, what's your one, you know, we are, as I read it, uh, really counting on trees across the world to help us manage uh, the carbon. And I just wondered what your general outlook was on, you know, on that situation. Uh, so worldwide, worldwide, yeah. <laughs> worldwide, yeah. So yes, trees are hugely important uh, in helping manage, you know, increase CO two and having lots of trees, and not cutting them down is hugely important. There are some really serious concerns about the, you know, the trillion tree. Um, campaigns and planting trees in many places that maybe aren't appropriate for having lots of trees. Um, and uh, Karen Hole, who's in our department, has written extensively and really eloquently about a lot of those, those problems. Not that we shouldn't be restoring and planting trees, but that we need to be doing it more thoughtfully than sometimes it's happening now. But there's a lot of also effort in understanding the importance of soil carbon grasslands and uh, non-tree carbon in, in contributing to those kinds of efforts. And that requires a lot of attention as well. So yeah, plants growing are hugely important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's a lot of attention to trying to increase the greenness of the planet uh, in constructive ways, um, but it, it is, it's a heavy lift. Thank you. Okay, somewhat related. Elliot, you had a related question about Brazilian rainforest. You there? 
Well, anyway, Elliot's question was, please discuss the implications of the Brazilian rainforest regarding the world's oxygen supply and carbon sequestration. You kind of touched on the carbon part. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I do not know about implications for the oxygen supply. So. I think, yeah, plus I think a big part of that comes from the ocean, from photosynthetic organic, probably mm. will save us as long as the ocean doesn't get too acidic and kill all of those, <laughs> yeah. those organisms. Uh, okay, uh, let's see if anybody else. Here. Oh, uh, kind of, we're running out of our time, but there was a question, I a question too. The fungi, you, were, you, you had a slide on the soil. I bet that was where the fungi was going to come in. <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of skipped around about that. So the soil was mainly we did very detailed soil nutrient and soil type maps uh, across, and we see tight linkages between um, soil properties and which tree species are growing in which places. That's not actually part of, that doesn't include looking at fungi. However, we um, have done quite a lot of work on fungi associated with um, and uh, this is work done with Ingrid, looking at the, the basically the networks of fungi, but not physical networks necessarily because it's fungi moving from one plant to another and spreading, you know, sometimes above ground, sometimes below ground and how they, they share the fungi and the impacts of those fungi on the hosts. There's also certainly a lot happening underground with, you know, mycorrhizal uh, networks and uh, the mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of use of the fur, and forest around there by people just out picking mushrooms. Um, and uh, so there's a lot happening there. We have not spent a lot of time on, on those uh, mycorrhizal networks, but um, that's always uh, they, an, an open area um, to, to work on. I've, my expertise and the need uh, has had me focusing mostly on the, the, the disease organisms so far. Okay, well, I think maybe maybe we'll bring this to a close at this point. That was Thank just her. terrific, Greg. It just so Thank many walking you. through those trees for 40 years and all of these questions, and you answered about 70% of them, but I have a few yeah. more left. <laughs> great. Right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It was, it was great, great to talk. meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so everybody, so this brings us to the end of the only academic year, but remember, we still have courses, still have interest groups. We hope to have a summer activity. And so stay in touch. Everybody stay in touch. We will see you. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Happy, yeah, happy thank you, Barry. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Happy, happy birthday. birthday, Barry. Okay, yeah. thank you. Wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, Barry. All right. Happy birthday. Thank you. Feliz cumpleaños. <laughs> All right.